Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Alumni University. We're so glad you could join us. Uh, I'm Kristen, the Director of Constituent Engagement here at Illinois Tech. Um, before we get started, just a few housekeeping notes. Please note that this presentation, including the chat, is being recorded and will be available on our alumni website in the next couple of weeks. Additionally, if you have questions throughout the presentation, please type them in the chat box at the bottom of the screen or raise your hand and we'll do our best to get to you before the end of the presentation. So to introduce our presenter, Joseph Orgel, PhD, is the Vice President for Academic Affairs here at, here at Illinois Tech. He's also a Professor of Biology and Bi Biomedical Engineering and the Associate Director of BioCat. He has an undergraduate degree and a PhD from the University of Sterling. And his presentation tonight is co-sponsored by the Office of Professional and Continuing Education. So I'm now going to turn it over to Jeremy Alexis, and he's going to speak briefly about the OPCE office. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for uh, letting me join tonight. Um, I am so excited to hear Dr. Argel talk. Um, so my talk will be very, very brief. Um, I just wanted to take this chance to uh, let all alumni know that uh, Illinois Tech is, is really working hard to revise and reimagine our continuing training and our executive training options. Um, we've uh, just started. Uh, we have a lot of plans. Uh, we're looking forward to a, a great year. Um, uh, feel free to reach out to us. It's opce at iit.edu um, is our email address. That's opce at iit.edu. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, we're already having lots of meetings with alumni who are helping us uh, understand uh, great ideas and great strategies for moving forward. But one of the things that we are really focused on is helping our great faculty at Illinois Tech um, begin to teach uh, some of the great things that they're that they're doing in their work, in their research, um, as well as uh, some of the, the Renaissance level activities that Joseph is doing as well. Um, so we're really hoping that uh, in the not so distant future, you're going to have as alumni a great set of offerings from our wonderful faculty uh, to do continuing training courses on. And as a bit of a quick, uh, uh, quick intro to what that can be, we, uh, we wanted to, to partner with the um, alumni group uh, to make sure that you got to hear one of our great faculty. So uh, I'm so excited to turn it over to Dr. Rogel and uh, have a great evening, everybody. As a double alum, it's great to be here. And um, I can't wait to hear what Joseph has to say. Thank you, Jeremy. Of course, you know, as soon as I start talking after a great intro like that, um, the expectations get to a point that I, I'm not sure I can fulfill. So um, to do the best I can, I suppose. All right. Uh, could one of the hosts confirm that I am sharing my presentation screen? Yes, you are. Looks great. Thank you. So, thank you so much. And can you hear me adequately? Yes, we can. Oh, okay. I just realized by asking Matt orally, you know, if you won, mm -hmm. that would be interesting. You just see my lips moving. Um, I want to go right ahead and explain my title a little bit. Some of you will be aware um, of a book uh, and a study by, um, by Scott Peck, The Road Less Traveled. I'm not really alluding to that. I'm reading to an earlier work, a poem um, by, uh, by Robert Frost called The Road Not Traveled. But one of the last lines in the poem talks about the road less traveled. And it's kind of what I want to allude to uh, in that poem. We talk about, or rather Robert Frost talked about, it's his poem, talks about wandering in a forest and seeing a fork in the road and seeing two choices, uh, a road that looks pretty easy to travel down, but another road that is intriguing. And it looks like maybe you don't want to go down there because it's overgrown and not many people have visited that. So I wanted to give you this idea that what I'm trying to allude to um, with the title of this talk is that might be the route to innovation. It's very easy in, um, in our daily practice to do what other people have done or to follow the crowd. Um, but trailblazing, that's a little bit more tricky. So I guess that is also part of my way to try and talk about 
uh, some of the things that I have done and alluding to what Jeremy is talking about in terms of Renaissance. So there's me as a Renaissance pirate on a tool ship um, and trying to give a bit of color and flavor of an associative and synergistic journey. Now, I say that just so you're less likely, uh, likely to accuse me of being eclectic in terms of my interests and professional and uh, professional practices. Um, before I came to Illinois Tech and became known as a biology professor, uh, I had lots of other disciplines that I participated in. Um, but it all started in an educational journey um, where I started my education as somebody who wasn't able to read or write until my age was in at double digits. I'm a learning disabled, proud neurodivergent individual who has figured out how to appear to be a little bit more normative, whatever that actually means. But more importantly, in my own particular journey, as I bounce around these subjects and, and professional activities, I picked up a commonality of practice and of thought that enables me to be able to navigate my own um, learning difficulties um, and at the same time be able to see some commonality across different disciplines. I don't know if you're aware of this, but it, it is sometimes thought in, um, in the philosophy of thought in artisan and professional activities that some of the best specialists in a particular discipline are actually multidisciplinarians. And because of the interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary practice, they're able to bring an extra something, a viewpoint or a series of innovations from their different disciplines into a discipline that was unfamiliar with that way of thinking or that way of practice. So in my um, very early professional career, um, I actually started out in theater and um, be the BBC, BBC Two. I was a, a teenage actor in a series called Scene. Um, and funnily enough, that also focused a lot on the psychology and sociology of human interaction. Um, I interned occupational psychology firm when I was, I believe I was 15 at the time, and I got exposed um, directly. I was involved in firm pitches um, to the British government in terms of services that would be presented. Um, and then I worked as a National Health Service, um, both employed by the National Health Service and as a consultant for a private company um, to provide services um, in the psychiatric space and in the social services space. And then as my, well, as I got older and I, my uh, bona fides become stronger and my resume gets longer, um, I've been able to take that experience and build upon it across uh, various areas of uh, private consultancy in industry, um, some charities and religious organizations. Um, and I'm really pleased to say that I've reached a point where I wanted to take that private practice and bring it into Illinois Institute of Technology and bring my professional practice as a person into um, the house of Illinois Tech. I think in many ways, um, I really mean the house of Illinois Tech. I think it's a place of maturation for young adults. It's not just a place of education, it's a place of self-discovery, um, self-empowerment. And professional preparation, yes, but also that opportunity to really work out who they are. Um, the students, of course, is who I'm talking about, but that should really rub off on the rest of us as well. The, the faculty, the staff, the alum, and, uh, and so forth. So within Illinois Tech, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of my research interests in a moment. Um, the, the vice provost part of things, if I am still associate director of FireCat, I'm in title alone, because I'm certainly not doing the work at this moment in time, but I am practicing in the X-ray diffraction kind of space. But um, as vice provost for academic affairs, I have a few things in my portfolio. Um, I have uh, offices that oversee every program that we, um, that we grant a degree in. Um, the academic honesty aspect of that, which is a non-trivial job to say the least. Um, the academic resource center. Um, this is where it starts to get interesting in particular, and it overlaps with some of what Jeremy was talking about in terms of our executive education. Um, so 
for the practice in the arts and the leadership scholars programs and the ELM is empowerment leadership and mentorship program. Um, I wanted to find an academic analog for executive education. And um, several years ago, I started working with the Student Government Association, to develop a homegrown, so belonging to Illinois Tech and particularly vested with the students, a homegrown version of empowering, leading, and mentoring each other, a peer mentorship program. And that was developed from the other professional exposure and activities that I have spent some time doing, some of the coaching that I've done for middle and upper management and executives um, myself, and in uh, change management practice as well. Building in some common skills that makes each of those situations go, go well, or at least not terribly. Um, and so that has reached a point where I'm now leveraging that interest and certainly the individuals who have been trained in these so-called soft skills into a professionalization of our student employment services. Um, this is a non-trivial thing. In the, the ARC, for instance, the Academic Re uh, Resource Center, um, we have at any one time between 50 and 100 student employees. And in that particular organization, they're helping other students, the client students, to do better in their studies, to learn better, but also to have confidence in themselves and to have that confidence confidence based upon a justifiable kind of practice because they're great at getting better. And we brought that same kind of practice into another group called academic coaches, into the resident assistant, um, into the first year experience, and now, as of right now, into the, um, the yield of students who have been admitted into college, been admitted into Illinois Tech, and helping them decide whether or not to come to Illinois Tech because they've been admitted into several other schools as well. So the goal behind all of this within Illinois Tech is the student success. And student success is defined sometimes through semi-quantified things like first to second year retention uh, or the graduation rate in 150% time of the program time. Uh, I like to take another approach as well and define student success as if the students feel successful and they've got some rational justification behind that. And I think that's really important. Uh, irrespective of whether or not they graduate, they need to feel that the time with us has been worthwhile. And we definitely want them to graduate too. Definitely want them to have a high placement, preferably 100% professional placement. Uh, within six months of graduating. So I mentioned the Empowerment Leadership and Mentorship Program and that professionalization and that confidence building of our students. Um, and um, I parlayed that into um, some activities that I was involved in. So for years, I've kept up a very low level, uh, sometimes semi-professional, sometimes amateur um, acting career. And uh, in 2019 and 2020, I took on um, a production, um, again, at that early stage of the Empowerment Leadership and Mentorship Program. But part of the reason why I decided to invest my, my spare time in this particular production of Shakespeare in Love um, was so that I could spend time with other actors who were the same age as our Illinois Tech students. And I wanted to have an environment where I could practice some of this home brewed version of empowerment leadership and mentorship program with a community that had never heard of it before. Take these principles and apply it fresh to a new population. So um, that picture on the left is, um, you may or may not have heard of a stage tradition called the legacy lobe, leg legacy robe, um, but it's something that's done in some productions by, um, by the company when they decided to honor another company member. And so um, I got a very pleasant surprise on opening night of this production where the company decided that I was the legacy road. And that was categorically because of the relationships I built with the cast members and helping them grow in their confidence as people, not just as performers. Uh, the, the lower right picture, uh, incidentally, in this particular production, the fight choreography and the dance choreography was performed by uh, Matt Hawkins 
who's the fight choreographer for at least 12 productions for Chicago Shakespeare Theatre. Um, so that's another side of me as well. I'm also a martial artist. Um, so getting this bit about me out of the way and taking the various other things that I've done outside of Illinois Tech and then slowly trying to bring that into the Illinois Tech uh, practice. So Jeremy mentioned that executive education. Um, so I'm part of that as well, working in the leadership and mentorship uh, area. Um, currently, I actually still have clients in IP development and advising in a manufacturing process in a couple of different spaces. Um, but I also hold a charter for a martial arts school. I, I'm not talking about having a studio. I've moved my actual physical practice into the sports union here at Keating so I can continue to practice the martial arts um, and also benefit our student population um, with no cost instruction in uh, Hapkido and a few different forms um, of Kung Fu. So pictures, of course, make this true, so I'll show you some of them. Um, on the right there, the person that uh, I'm giving a half hug to is Bill Wallace. Um, the, the man is a legend. He was undefeated world kickboxing champion for 20 years. Uh, this summer, I got to, uh, to co-teach alongside him um, in a, a martial arts seminar for martial arts instructors. Um, on the bottom left, that's me giving a flight lesson to a recent aeronautical engineering graduate. Um, and then top, top left and bottom right, uh, some fight scenes using butterfly swords Shailen Butterfly Swords in a uh, in an indie film and a TV series called Kung Fu Redemption. Um, and then just for giggles, um, that right picture is me leading the charge of uh, kicking a member of the Queen's Guard at the local Renaissance Fair in the Chicago, Milwaukee area. Um, I was the master of ceremonies for the joust for that fair for a little while. I uh, also had a comedy troupe that uh, I used to call with. And I say all this used to, you know, now that I'm vice provost for academic affairs, I can work any 80 hours of the week that I want. It's kind of flexi time, but the amount of time I need to put into it is intense. So uh, I don't do this much at the moment. But I want to, to give that little bit of color as to who I am as a flamboyant and not eclectic person. Um, about part of what I mean about thinking interdisciplinary in an interdisciplinary way. Um, what, is, what is the connection between the fine arts and particle physics and aeronautical engineering and psychology, just as a for instance? Um, the fact is they're all disciplines practiced by humans. They're all people who think. And the experience of the practitioners who think and experience and feel are all experienced and felt by the same neurons in the central nervous system. Um, and so what we do and how we do it in one particular discipline affects us in another one. Or what we do in one part of our life affects us in another. Um, the same neurons that experience physical pain for us are the same neurons that experience emotional pain for us. So that's one connection, but then there's also concepts. So if you can see my kinetics and thermodynamics diagram here, um, just relating to the principles about how thermodynamics and kinetics can, well, kinetics can get in the way of a reaction that seems perfectly viable, uh, something called activation energy to overcome. So that hill is the increase in total energy that's needed for your reaction to go to the thermodynamically viable kind of product. So for instance, sodium chloride dissolving in water should be quite straightforward, but there's a little, a little activation hill to overcome for that. Not as big as I'm, I'm showing in this particular diagram. Um, and that's the, it's called the reaction complex. So there's a transition state that takes more energy to get over than the final state is. The final state is fine. It's like rolling a boulder down a hill, it'll get there. But to get to the downhill part, you have to get over the hump first, if you like. So that kind of makes sense in, in chemical kind of terms. So let's take that same kind of concept and put it into consumer decision making, marketing decisions, getting, getting someone to click on an email that's sent out in a marketing campaign, in a telemarketing campaign, getting someone to respond to the phone call, 
Um, and then in behavioral kind of dynamics, the procrastination problem and the deferment problem, which is related to procrastination. Um, those latter two in particular are things that we have to deal with in terms of providing student services to students who know that they need help, that they defer getting that help. They may have explanations um, that are more emotionally based, but they're rationalized. Uh, I want to prove that I can do it, or I'm embarrassed and ashamed that it will be, it will look like I'm weak. So, so getting over that hill, getting over that transitory complex, emotionally speaking, conceptually speaking, is something that applies to another discipline, not just in, in chemistry. In another context, how about um, management and the managed in terms of the failure to communicate? So I, I have a, a, the managed here is rock climbing to the top of this particular hill, and the manager is losing their mind because they're focused on the end state being so obvious. Why can't you just do the job? It's right there. In the meantime, the managed is what's wrong with you, manager? There's all of these complex relationships that I have to navigate before I can get there. And this same concept applies in organizational structures, where let's say you have senior leadership versus middle management versus the managed, and the middle management are unable to explain the kind of nuanced and intangible problems that the senior management wants to execute for the managed overall. In the meantime, the managed might actually have the same perspective of what's your problem? We should just get on with it. So the same kind of concept of getting over the transition state applies in social dynamics, in marketing, whether or not you want to buy a good or a kind of poor can opener, um, and also in the thermodynamics context. But I want to take this theme of the interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary uh, context into how we've been doing our research in the Orgel lab um, for the last 20 years or so. So this is when it's going to, to get kind of interesting. Um, how is it that we have a focus on traumatic brain injuries and brain diseases and arthritis and cancer and injury and repair and the heart diseases and so on? Really, are we deluding ourselves that we have some kind of insight into each of these areas? Yeah, I think there is. And um, so Terry, do you think there's a benefit of teaching or requiring arts education for science or engineering majors? The short answer to that is yes. And I'm gonna keep that in mind as well and try and weave that into, into more of what I'm talking about. I categorically agree with that, Kenny, categorically. Um, in this particular picture that I'm showing you, uh, on the left, there is a series of X-ray diffraction pictures I'm showing. And um, A, if you can see that, is picture 51, uh, B form DNA. Uh, and I have a not, uh, not tenuous connection to Rosalind Franklin and Raymond Goslin in terms of my academic pedigree as well. And that's part of the reason why I, I show that there. But using X-ray diffraction and various forms of microscopy, um, we have some insight into various tissue formations. Um, and the tissue formations gives us insight into a whole series of disease and conditions. So by looking at the connecting points in the interdisciplinary, we're able to span multidisciplinary context. And that's kind of what I've done a lot in my scientific career is look for the low hanging fruit that is often at the interfaces between disciplines where people are less inclined to go. So maybe if you know the poem by, um, by Frost, you might see where I'm alluding to. That dark and wooded section is actually quite an attractive area to go exploring. Um, so by using these X-ray diffraction techniques combined with the microscopy techniques, we found a way um, of determining the fundamental structures of tissues at a molecular uh, level, and then we're able to apply that to these different diseases. Uh, and at the same time, on the left, I'm showing a little bit about the resolution problem. Um, bring that into the instructional context. Um, one of the IPROs that I run, that I have run in the past, um, has to do with creating an ultra high resolution light microscope to look at a tissue context. So one of these things um, that we've done is taken this X-ray diffraction and applied it to traumatic brain injury. Um, so in this particular picture, I'm showing X-ray diffraction, so that grayscale picture on the left, 
is the X-ray diffraction from uh, um, a mammal's neuron. It's actually from the optic nerve. And the X-ray diffraction enables us to measure the spaces between the myelin layers. So um, that's in that middle picture, the spiral with the little gaps and so on. And then on the right picture, where it says PLP and TAM and those kind of extracellular spaces and the cytoplasm and so on, those are fluid-filled spaces, water-filled spaces. When there's a hit to the head and a concussion occurs, water floods into those myelin spaces. Um, and that's part of what causes the concussion and separating those myelin layers and interfering with the conduction of normal. And it's not electrical conduction, it's a mechanical and an ion exchange conduction in the neurons. It disrupts the signal in any event, uh, makes you feel fuzzy, woozy, uh, can also make you dead, uh, but also can lead to long-term, almost intangible problems faced by the person who has had a concussion, usually multiple concussions. Um, so this is research that was sponsored by uh, the Army Research Lab, uh, specifically at the time Weapons Directorate A, uh, sponsored my group to go in and measure precisely what the mechanical dose was to lead to the very first indication um, of, of an irreversible change. Uh, it was a little bit like a moonshot, and amazingly, we hit it. Um, and then six years later, we're still funded. We've, we're on our fourth or fifth grant. I can't remember exactly. Fourth or fifth grant, um, starting with this particular research. And it's taken us from the brain to skeletal muscles to the heart. And now we're back to the brain again on that particular journey, using very much the same techniques in different contexts. So how this applies as a neuroscientist, how this applies um, to, to human biology, it really requires using multiple different techniques and an interdisciplinary kind of focus. Um, what I'm showing you here is a, a EEG of a patient's brain um, for a clinical um, neuro uh, diagnostic outfit. It's actually a neuropsychiatrist um, a professional practice that I consulted with for about 15 years. Um, and in this particular picture, we have a series of two-dimensional EEGs, so brain scans, if you like, monitoring the electrical activity across the brain. Um, and we have a patient here who has just into the quantitative scale of a moderate brain injury. Um, moderate brain injury is, is like a misnaming. It's a misnomer. Uh, there's no such thing as a moderate brain injury. It's, it's bad. A mild brain, brain injury is bad. Uh, what's interesting in this particular brain scan is that uh, the patient has temporal uh, and lateral damage, specifically in their language senses. Um, the auditory processing area, Runnick's area for auditory decoding, and Brock's area for speaking the spoken word. What's particularly interesting to me to explain at this moment in time is that's my brain. Um, and it kind of explains an awful lot of my childhood of not being able to articulate myself very well and to just hear the sounds that are being said, but not understanding the language, not understanding the meaning, which really um, led to some serious learning difficulties for me as a child. But in the end, I'm grateful for it because in trying to jump over those particular problems, it's taught me how to be really agile in my thinking. So then to, to zoom through some of the science, um, in 2006, uh, my group published um, using an approach, a combined um, neuro mapping approach and simulated annealing and metropolis algorithm 1953 kind of inspired approach. I was able to deconvolve a lot of complex information in the X-ray diffraction from a bit of uh, tissue extracted directly from the organism and to work out exactly where the collagen triples were in molecular terms down to nano, uh, nanometer uh, levels. And because we were able to do that for the most um, common collagen, uh, most common collagen, which is the most common protein in the animal body, that gave, gives us a platform to look at a numerous number of things. Um, in this publication, taking that elucidation of the structural arrangement of collagen circles, we're able to apply that into how molecules in the extracellular matrix, so that's the matrix that interacts with cells, um, how that is able to affect prolific processes prolific processes being cancer, autoimmunity, um, the arthritis and, and uh, rheumatism, so, to, to name just a few. 
taking that a step further, I thought a few years later, why don't we take some antibodies, take some immune molecules, and look directly at uh, collagen molecules. So collagen verbal diagram at the top left there, um, that's uh, atomic force microscopy showing in tapping mode, showing native fibrils of atomy adjustment, and then the antibody treated is actually in the molecules added um, against the, uh, the type 1 collagen molecule there. Um, and it took about 11 years, but we were able to elucidate precisely where that's binding in molecular terms, um, just in time for the COVID pandemic. Um, this particular discovery has some relevance to pulmonary fibrosis. Um, and I'm continuing to consult with uh, a pharma organization on this, um, but also uh, I have relationships with uh, MD researchers in New York, um, where we're looking at some of the long-term aspects of long COVID uh, in relation to this research. Um, to be able to get to that stage, it involved uh, a long-term, more than 20 years now, collaboration with the BioCap, with the advanced photon source and working on synchrotron uh, radiation techniques and particular optical parameters to be able to make this diffraction work, um, both for my own group, um, for that of other participants in the BioCap collaborative um, and for any scientist um, who wanted to get access and to justify it in a competitive grant proposal. Uh, covered a range of organisms and a range of uh, and organs um, and some of that research, such as um, the organization of teeth, uh, has applications to the design of prostheses, otherwise known as fillings, and also prostheses in dentistry. Uh, so this is a, a publication we made a, a, about 10 years ago now um, that had a significant disruptive influence in certain areas of dentistry, I'm pleased to say. Um, Part of the work that started out with the army, uh, primarily in traumatic brain injury, we moved on into looking at a really interesting space of robotically assisted surgery for mitral heart valve repair, for instance. Um, I figured if we could define the, the strain field in the mesonomic scale and the nanometer scale, in a particular part of the mitral heart valve, we might be able to make an immediate contribution as to how to best repair the bits that have a higher tendency to fail. Um, so if you if you want to look at tiny squares on your screen, there's a particular area in that mitral valve, the molecular versus engineering strain uh, area in there. There's a particular dark blueprint in the mitral valve that's the point of failure um, right at the point between the papillary muscles and just as the leaflet, the actual valve part begins to form. So we identified it rather, uh, rather precisely. Um, did some work on bone and the mineralization in that area. And then I'm just going to zoom ahead and talk about dinosaurs, uh, because anytime you mention dinosaurs, you really get people's attention. Um, this is my single most read paper uh, that I've ever published. And I'm certain it's because it says dinosaur. The fact that it says peptide suggests mechanism of protein survival is just kind of like a, an adjunct to that point. Um, but in this particular paper, still applying these principles of the interdisciplinary um, techniques and what they tell us about the story of what's going on, something interesting occurred. Um, my collaborator, collaborator, a paleontologist called Mary Schwarzer, um, discovered T. rex um, tissues embedded in fossils, um, again, about 20 years ago, and um, a lot of people didn't believe her. So it was quite interesting when she did the protein sequencing um, for these tissues, and then um, I wrote to her and said, why don't we go ahead and see where they map on my structure? And it turned out that those protein sequences that she was pulling out from these tissues, the bits that really survive intact, are the bits that have the most relevance to the biological function of the tissue from which they come from. And the reason why the dinosaurs and the ancient elephants teach us about modern biology is because it turns out that nature is really keen for these bits of the tissue to not be exposed when the animal is alive until such time as the body is ready for these little bits of the tissue to be available to the blood and the cell fluid and so on. Because when those bits of the tissue are exposed to the cell fluid and the blood and the so on, bad things happen, such as cancer and proliferate diseases. And so what the body has done 
has taken these particular sequences and bound them up really tight and used something called structural blocking to stop those sequences being accessed by cells until such time as the body is ready for those sequences. to And that, because they're so tightly bound and so tightly controlled, is the reason, presumably, why those sequences survive across millions of years so well inside of these fossils. Um, if you don't believe that, here is a, um, a fiber I extracted personally from a Brachiosaurus uh, fossil uh, lent to me by the Field Museum um, under a destructive loan. Um, and uh, we also collected some X-ray diffraction from an 18 million year old T-Rex fiber. I also isolated this directly from the T-Rex uh, fossil myself. And because I was really, and this is X-ray diffraction from that really old uh, fiber. Um, I was interested to see how well bones survive out in nature. Um, I, so I got one of my collaborators that mentioned that they had been riding the same section of prairie in Montana uh, for a while and said that there's a skeleton that they'd seen out there for 40 years, a horse skeleton that they'd seen out there for 40 years. So I got them to give me a shaving from the pelvis and this is the diffraction we got, which is um, actually a little bit better than the recently deceased uh, rat bone that we diffracted from as well. Anyway, enough of that, and I'm now going to build up to the crescendo at the end of this talk. We're looking for our students to succeed with this kind of interdisciplinary kind of paradigm, this approach to taking thought and process into justifiable confidence and into a way of being. Um, so I mentioned this empowerment, leadership, and mentorship um, set of principles. What if we could get our student population to really learn how to learn. So that's what we've done, is build in a, a mnemonic and a strategy and a spoken word transmitted system. So it's a five part system for really listening and communicating well and effective. And communicating and listening in an empathetic way so it builds relationships and in a way that is sustainable and in a way that doesn't advance oneself over and above and separate from advancing the everyone who's on the team. So that helped power a really conscientious form of leadership, but also a really strong participatory type of followership at the same time. And then we embedded that into our professional student organization, as well as our scholar organization. Um, and we're seeing some tangible effects because we've also embedded it into our learning paradigm. So you see the soft skills of the observation and chunking organizations of sermons and memorization. So we made an academic version of this ELM called General Learning Strategies. And um, over the last several years, we see something very interesting happen, which is those people who take this learning strategies course, um, they tend to improve their academic grades by a lesser grade, excuse me, on average. And one of the most important areas is going from the one and two, which is academic probation in the undergraduate sense, to good standing, two and three. And then you may notice um, before attending, we have in the three to 4.0 GPA range, before taking GLS, we have those 20 participants and afterwards more than doubled the number of people who are in that very strong tenant GPA range. So why does this work? Um, well, you've heard of Putipo <laughs> for one thing, Empowerment also has something to do with hope and feeling confident. And the feeling of confidence really takes you a long way. All the more so if there's something tangible to it as well. And all the more so if the open limbic loop, so that fundamental bit of brain neurology that powers your fight or flight or your stroll and stay, keeps you alert or hypervigilant or keeps you focused and engaged, um, Human beings are very sensitive to each other's mental state as well, particularly in that limbic system. So we pick up on these social cues from each other, both spoken and observed. When you get a group of people who are really resonating with that kind of open loop, with a, a vision, an idea that they share, it has a societal impact. So this particular study that I'm referring to here, Social Consensus for the Influence of Committed Minorities, um, is also funded from the Army Research Lab from Weapons Director at A because it was a precursor to recognizing how social media um, affects people's opinions. And I don't need to rehash that in this particular call. It's still too soon. Um, the kind of things that we've seen and experienced 
at a societal level. But what about if we turn this around for good? So when you get a committed and organized minority of people, when you get to about 10% of a population that have a consensus in the way that they talk and the way that they present a particular ideal, the entire community takes it on as a permanent value. So how do we do that at Illinois Tech? Um, already been doing it. So we've got a number of levers that we can, we can use to help bring about a, a kind of positive um, social change. Um, a rising tide floats all boats. So in helping the overall academic performance improve, helping the professional preparation improve, helping the morale and the goodwill on campus in general. So we have quite an intricate um, series of groups that, uh, that we have some influence over, such as the Leadership Scholar Programs, the Cameras, Leadership Academy, um, Greer Scholars, Lucian Schwab Scholars, and so on. Um, academic coaches who I employ, um, faculty and staff, who if they catch the vision, they're part of our finite scale group of strong influences. Um, so if the finite scale group of strong influences have a vision and they pass that on to the student body in general, then you create the conditions where you get an infinite scale of frames to take on the message, to take on the vision, to take on um, Remember I was alluding to the ELM, the kind of um, the very succinct way of expressing and teaching a certain set of skills that are so-called soft interpersonal skills that also can be used um, to improve your academic kind of perception and performance. But they also work in terms of community value communication as well. So we've taken the academic coaches and those who are in the ELM uh, leadership structure, the scholarship group, um, and certified peer mentors. And I'm not going to explain every single bit of this, but each of these people um, and groups helping to positively influence, and that's with agency and with consent. This is not manipulation, this is influence, um, peer mentors within the population. And we've taken that to a new level this particular year where those peer mentors have become paid positions, not just volunteer positions. And they're helping us with um, helping admitted students for fall 22 decide whether or not they're coming to the school. Um, and it's important that it's not a sales call in that interaction, that it really is uh, an engagement of what do you want to get out of college? And does Illinois Tech fit that? If it does, great. And if it doesn't, have a good life and maybe we'll see you for graduate school. Um, and then Building upon that into the next level, when these admitted students become enrolled students with us, they have a support system already waiting for them. When and part of the way that this works is by having this continual refinement between the constituency, the people you're trying to affect, and the goal with a vision in the middle, and continually involving constituencies with the goal and the vision formation and the application of that vision. So some of how this looks. Um, in terms of formed elements and instructed elements in the student journey as undergraduates as they come through our school, um, we have particular contact points that are already mapped out, uh, some in more detail than others, to help the students as they grow and develop as they pass through um, the undergraduate program. And we have an inbuilt vision that we already work on, the Gonzalez Million Dollar Sermon. If I'm so this is my personal translation into the 21st uh, century context. Um, I would describe it as social change through technical innovation. Um, it was said to be industrial at the time that the sermon, uh, the, the sermon was given, but I think this is a, a technical innovation makes sense in the 21st. And then we have effectors and influencers, people who are articulate in the vision, in that positive community change and that empowerment and being a participatory follower, as well as being an articulate, empathetic and engaged leader. Um, so the academic coaches that we have right now are listed on the, the right. Uh, Rama uh, has worked in my research lab for 11 years at this point, is now also the leader of the art. Um, Sarah, Andrew, Nisha, Natalie, Chris, Isabel and Belle um, are current academic scholars. Oh, and by the way, they're clinical psychologists from our PhD program. Um, and then those peer mentors, Andrea um, came, from the Excellent, came through the Exelon Summer Institute. She's a team lead in this yield engagement that later on is going to become 
uh, the group of first year mentors as these admitted students become enrolled students. And then we strive, strive to get, bring this technical vision onto um, the, the next stage of staff and faculty development as well. Um, I've mentored a number of our, our staff um, and some of our faculty in this uh, empowered, empathetic form of active communication with active talking, active listening, um, and showing regard for one with the other, and building that into an improved and sustainable practice, uh, remembering that the latest technical tools, and certainly not Zoom, the latest technical tools are not a replacement for good educational practice. Um, and so giving each of the people that we mentor, each of the people that we instruct, the tools to not only um, be fed at that moment in time intellectually, not to just be sitting in a lecture and taking on the superficial tenants um, that they can forget after the exam, but taking on practices that they can build on for a lifetime. And so if they're open, if they've learned the foundations to be at least teachable in the moment, they should have certain amount of instantaneous success, but then building in the understanding that over time, they will gradually become masters. So um, I'll be happy to uh, take your questions at this time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Joseph. Um, so uh, just a reminder to anyone, if you have a question, please feel free to type it in the chat or to raise your hand. Um, so I actually have a question of my own. Um, if you could talk a little bit about how alumni or community members could get involved in um, some of the work and education in innovation, whether that's through IPRO or for, through uh, similar programs. Yeah, I, I, I have a whole bunch of things. That could be a long conversation. Um, so first of all, it's important to say that you're wanted. Alumni are wanted to be engaged. Um, the, the current student population wants to connect with you. So it's kind of that activation barriers. What's in the way? What's the reaction complex for that to become a thing? Um, a certain amount of it on their part is respect and confidence. They don't want to just reach out to you uninvited. So they need some kind of structures to, to be able to do that. Um, we're going to increasingly um, have some structures for alumni to be engaged, as, engaged with as mentors, try and lower that activation barrier for getting involved. And that could be mentors for internship. And I don't mean sponsors. I mean, yes, I mean sponsors too. But I mean to give advice and to provide the benefit of perspective to really be mentors in that context. Um, for people who, for young people, our students who are entering or thinking about going into internship and for professional uh, practice. I, I have to say, in an incidental conversation from meeting with some student leaders a, a couple of weeks ago, I ended up giving them a lot of advice on how to format their resume uh, and how to go about getting their foot in the door uh, in particular, um, particular job opportunities that they wouldn't have had the insight into otherwise. And it's not just a matter of, oh, go and look up on LinkedIn. There are particular approaches and techniques that employers are a bit more familiar with or a bit more receptive to. So some of those insider perspectives that have taken us decades to develop can mean the difference between night and day to, to these young students. So being, being willing to be an advisor and a mentor in that context. Um, there are some initiatives such as this uh, yield initiative that I have alluded to. I think um, going into the future, having some alum to these calls, um, and I don't mean a sales pitch, I mean, sit down and talk with the admitted students about whether or not Illinois Tech fits for them. What do they want out of college? How do they want to grow? Will this work with Illinois Tech? Oh, it does? Well, I've got to tell you, for me, you're making a good choice because of X, Y, Z. It's profoundly powerful for those young people. So those would be a, a couple of indicators. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I'll leave just a couple more seconds here if anyone else has any questions. Um, I haven't seen any others come through the chat. So thank you again. Um, thank you so much. And just a reminder to everyone that this was recorded and it will be available on our website at iat.edu slash alumni university in the next couple of weeks. So thank you again. <laughs>